Hi, everyone. My name is Ed Nightingale. I'm the Director of Engineering for Azure Sphere. It's a pleasure to be here today. And today I'm going to be, in this first talk, uh, diving in a little bit into uh, the principles that lie behind Azure Sphere, why we're building this product, and what our goals are. So Azure Sphere is a business focused around microcontrollers. It's the low-cost, single-chip computers that we're all familiar in talking about inside of IoT. And there are about 9 billion new MCU devices that are built and deployed every single year. Uh, the thing about microcontrollers is they're really the fabric of computing in our everyday lives. They're the computers you never notice, right? If you have a screen, if you have a device with a button, it probably has an MCU inside of it. They're in your homes, your hotel room, and in your offices. Uh, and historically, the way I think about MCU development is that it's fire and forget. You build an MCU to do one thing. It runs a clock on a VCR. Uh, it runs a motor, and it does nothing else. And that's what it does for the lifetime of the device. And you write that software once, it works in a constrained environment, and you never have to worry about it again. But the sea change we're seeing, and I think that many of us are focused on in our mind, is connectivity. This is 2014, where you had an MCU with an on-die radio. And this is the big change that we're all thinking about. I think this chip at the time was $2.50. And when you can connect anything to the internet for less than a cup of coffee, the question is, why wouldn't you? And so this is leading to a huge sea change. And the, the fundamental thing I want to keep in mind as you think about this change, and we'll get into the motivation a little bit more in a second, is that when you take a single purpose fire and forget computer and connect it to the internet, it suddenly has the potential and capability to be a general purpose computer capable of doing anything an attacker wants it to do. And so that is the change in thought and the change in thinking that's led to a lot of the development inside of Azure Sphere. Now, there is still occasionally get questions about why would you want to connect a device to the internet. This is the simplest example, the one I always come back to. Uh, you wake up in the morning and you come downstairs and ice cream is all over the floor because the compressor stopped working your refrigerator and your freezer. And that leads to an unhappy family, it leads to unhappy kids, at least in my household. An alternative is that you wake up and you have a phone call from the person who, uh, company that built your refrigerator. And they say, look, we uh, see that your compressor is about to fail. We have someone who's in the neighborhood. Would it be OK if we came by and replaced it? Fundamentally, a different experience that is made possible through connectivity, a very simple one that leads to better brand loyalty, to a better experience with your devices, and in general, less smelted ice cream. So this connectivity is really all about the democratization of IoT. It enables IoT devices to have a digital feedback loop to connect customers, operations, and products and assets. It also allows brands that typically lost their customer relationship at a store to continue that relationship long after the product is bought, which changes the way companies think about selling their products and really think of having an ongoing relationship with the devices they interact with. It also empowers employers and employees to really better understand the products that they've built. So the opportunity. So at the National Retailer Federation in January, we announced a partnership with Starbucks. Starbucks is using Azure Sphere uh, to connect all of its coffee makers uh, in all of its stores all over the world. It's one of our flagship partners. You might ask why. Uh, the Mastrana coffee makers that Starbucks uses actually has recipes that they can send and update in firmware to make a better cup of coffee. And they change those recipes a couple times a year. The way they change them right now is they flash 8,000 USB sticks and send people to stores to change that recipe. Now, that's inefficient, but it also reflects the risk to your business of having something connect to the internet when you don't have confidence and security. Because in this business, if they lost a coffee maker, that's a loss to their brand, and it's also, quite frankly, a huge loss to their revenue. So this is the opportunity, and this opportunity over and over and over again in enterprises going through digital transformation is an opportunity not just to create better customer experiences, but in this case, to simply improve on their ROI. Connections to the internet securely with something they have confidence in allows them to, quite frankly, improve margins. So that's the opportunity. So let's talk about the risk. What happens when you connect a device to the internet? Why are we talking about PSA in the last talk? Well, baby monitors spy on you, refrigerators send spam, and cameras launch bot dot DDoS attacks and take down portions of the internet. Uh, it's, it's embarrassing. I'm sure everyone in this room is, looks up in the newspaper or somewhere in the internet every other day and sees some sort of attack on some IoT device and you shake your head and just say, man, isn't that, isn't that sad? We, we have to do better. This is, th these types of attacks, these types of uh, 
devices that start to spy on people. It's a loss of trust, quite frankly, from the computing industry. Uh, and it's a call to action for a better set of, of really basics. So the Bri botnet for the Azure Sphere team was a real turning point for us when we were thinking about the development of this product. You know, we talk about that MCU, that fire and forget device that suddenly becomes a general purpose computer. The Mirai Botnet is a fantastic example of it. 100,000 cameras took down the East Coast of the internet effectively, catastrophically, 100,000. If you look at appliances that I just talked about earlier, a couple slides ago, there are roughly 300 million appliances sold every year around the world. If you imagine 100 million connected refrigerators decided to launch a denial of service attack. This is just 100,000 devices. It exploited a well-known weakness. It's embarrassing. These cameras had a fixed default password called ROOT. You couldn't change the password. And then once it was discovered that this was the problem, there was no way to remotely update the device. So I don't know how many of you end up acting as IT support for your extended family, but I don't know if you can imagine having people call you and ask you, how do I burn a USB stick to plug into my camera to update it. It's just, not, it's just not something we should think about. But these devices are flowing off into the world with a fire and forget mentality for software, when in reality, the world where anything that they think that device was built for, it can be used for anything else. The other one that I really like is the uh, hackers attacking a casino. This is a connected thermometer that was put into a fish tank to measure the water temperature, to make sure those fish stayed alive. Someone bounced an attack through the thermometer onto the network and then got into the high roller database and stole it. So somebody says to me, well, it's just a thermometer. Why is security important? Isn't my threat model different? Well, no. Your threat model is that if it's connected to the internet, it can be a general purpose computer. And then someone says, well, shouldn't have this casino have known better? Shouldn't they have better network security? Shouldn't they have better ops on site? Shouldn't they be separating their networks into low security and high security devices? And my response is, well, why do they have to do that? It's a casino. Shouldn't they be able to trust that anything that's going to connect to the internet has a basic level of security that's going to protect their assets? I'm going to beat this dead horse one more time. So imagine coming downstairs, and instead of melted ice cream, you have a text on your phone. It says, we own your fridge. Send us $5 in Bitcoin, or we melt all the ice cream. That would be a very unhappy family in my household if ransomware took over my refrigerator, my innocuous device. But even worse, the thing that really keeps me up at night is that hackers decide that they know how to turn on the gas and then arbitrarily ignite the stove later. This is actually a real problem that one of the appliance manufacturers ran into where they realized you could uh, chain an attack into this and then suddenly your household appliance turns into a bomb. Nobody wants to make these insecure devices. No manufacturer wants to risk their brand. And the question is, OK, well, you know we have these problems. You try to keep hackers out of your device. You're going to follow best practices. But what happens when they do get in? How do you respond to it? Well, the first thing I hear sometimes is, well, our, our code is better. We follow better practices. We have better processes. We have better engineers. Well, sure, but your product has bugs. This is the NIST uh, security vulnerability causes from 08 to 17. You can see that uh, exponential blue line. That was just buffer overruns. That's one of the oldest known problems in software engineering is the classic and simple buffer overrun. And there's been a massive spike in reports there. I think that's mainly because we're building better tools to find these bugs. But we're going to keep implementing them. We're going to keep producing software that has bugs. I just don't think as an industry we're there to just claim that we're simply better than that anymore. And if your product has bugs or you depend on a piece of software or component that has bugs, which your software is only as strong as its weakest component, then that means hackers are going to get in. So security is foundational. It has to be built in from the beginning. You cannot bolt it on afterwards. So this is where Microsoft has come in with Azure Sphere and to start a conversation around IoT security. We published a white paper called The Seven Properties of Highly Secured Devices. And this is a white paper online that you can read. And this is a call to action that says that any device that's going to connect to the open internet should have these seven properties. If they don't, they should be connected in some other way. You should find some other way to protect or keep these devices off the internet. Without, at minimum, these seven properties, the risk is just too high. It's a hardware to trust, defense and depth strategy, a small trusted computing base, dynamic compartments, certificate-based authentication, failure reporting, and renewable security. 
So I'm going to go through each of these in turn and just give you a little bit of insight about what you mean by this. But please go grab the white paper. Please follow up with Ryan or I or else in the Azure Sphere team. We love having conversations around this. So hard to read a trust, an unforgeable cryptographic identity that you can detail, identify the device, uh, hardware having a private key that is actually private, public key that allows you to establish an identity, uh, allows you to bootstrap secure boot, and more importantly, uh, measured boot, which we'll talk about uh, in the two talks later today. It also allows you to attest that the device is not just running genuine code, but it's running trusted code, which are actually two pretty important different things. Next, a small trusted computing base. You're, you're, the, the computing base, I think a lot of people in this room are familiar with this. Uh, the software that's most important to your product, the one that has access to your secrets, should be as small as possible. The smaller it is, then the easier it is to reason about its correctness and also uh, and maintain it. So effectively reducing your attack surface. An example, having your security monitor with trust zone or running a hypervisor so you meet the kernel. And ideally, your trusted computing base should be measured in kilobytes and not megabytes. Dynamic compartments and defense in depth. Dynamic compartments, as you're familiar with operating systems, we're thinking about MMUs, process-based isolation, uh, allowing you to address-based virtualization, as well as defense in depth strategies. The more defense in depth you have, the harder it is for an attacker to chain together a set of attacks. It's simply there to slow someone down and make it more difficult. The fewer defense depth layers you have, the easier it is for once someone finds that attack to get entry to absolutely everything, rather than only one small part of the software that you're shipping. Certificate-based authentication is allowing us to establish an identity for a device, uh, to know who that device is, and to ensure that it's in a good state, uh, and can issue shortlist certificates. So we actually, in Azure Sphere, uh, our attestation service issues certificates effectively as a security token. So the devices don't ship with that device certificate, but we generate that on the fly, and it's only good for a very short period of time, effectively vouching for the fact that Microsoft is attesting to the health of this device. Finally, failure reporting and renewable security. I think of this as closing the loop. We talk about what happens when an attacker does get in and compromises a system because they found a weakness, then how do you handle and respond to it? Well, failure reporting allows you to gather reports across millions of devices and detect that something has gone wrong. Without that failure reporting, that incoming loop, you're just guessing or waiting for someone to call you, send an email, and let you know that they think something's wrong or you see a report in the news. And the renewable security, you need the cloud, to provide those software updates. You need software to apply the updates and hardware to prevent rollback attacks, a class of attack where uh, an attacker convinces a device to load a valid but known buggy version of your software. You need hardware to defend against those types of attacks and ensure those rollback attacks cannot happen. So those seven properties uh, are the properties that I said Microsoft is laying down a line to say that if you don't have these seven properties, you shouldn't allow this device to connect to the internet. You should effectively treat it as a legacy device or a fire and forget device because you shouldn't count on the fact that it's going to be able to stand up to uh, attacks on the internet. Now, meeting the seven properties is super challenging. You have to design and build a holistic solution. You're only secure as the weakest link. Uh, you have to have the technical expertise to, disparate, to stitch these disparate security components together and make sure you have an end-to-end -end solution as an as a OEM or as a device manufacturer that can both respond to threats and update them, as well as ensure the silicon meets these minimum security bars. You also have to be able to recognize and mitigate emerging threats. You have to have security experts available to you to identify these threats, create updates as they're needed to mitigate them, and ship them in a timely manner. And you have to be able to distribute and apply these updates on a global scale if you have a global product. You have to be able to have the infrastructure, logistics, and operational excellence to ensure you can deliver and deploy updates in your fleet of devices and hours. So Azure Sphere, I think it was a case study as a product that we're uh, hoping is an example of a product that meets all seven properties. So Azure Sphere is an end-to-end -end solution focusing on three pillars, Azure Sphere certified chips, this Azure Sphere operating system, and the Azure Sphere security service. I'll touch on each of these briefly. So Azure Sphere certified chips have a hardware-based root of trust that's created by Microsoft with license for free to uh, Silicon partners. That's based on experiences from securing our own Xbox platform for three generations against attackers. The uh, Xbox platform is um, a great target for an attacker and there's been a lot of experience built in and we've derived our own uh, hardware root of trust for IoT based on the experiences and lessons learned there. And a certified chip simply means that this chip 
meets a minimum set of security requirements that Microsoft has laid out for an IoT connected device. So an example is the MediaTek 3620. Uh, it's a template for secure chips. It's our first in-market mass-produced uh, Azure Sphere certified chip. So there's a Cortex-M. This is for real-time processing. This is your typical MCU. And of course, there's connectivity. Any Azure Sphere device is focused on connectivity, so it's being connected to the internet in some way. Then there's the Pluton security subsystem. This is the hardware root of trust that I've been mentioning. Ryan and I are both in the following talks been doing a bit of a deep dive and talk about how it's integrated into software and what capabilities it provides in hardware, along with what these are called Firewalls is really features in silicon as a defense in depth measure to, as an example, guarantee that peripherals can only be mapped to certain cores. And then we call it a crossover MCU because it has a Cortex A, in addition to Cortex M. That Cortex A is where we're focused on connectivity, it's where we're running a Linux kernel, and it's where you're having an additional headroom, as we talked about earlier, for machine learning uh, and AI algorithms, as well as a minimum of 4 megs of, of, of RAM and uh, 16 megs of flash. So there's dev kits now that you can grab if you want to play with one. Uh, and we have an a, a ecosystem of partners producing uh, dev kits as well as modules for, for mass production. So this is Sphere's operating system. It's a defense in depth OS that's uh, produced by Microsoft. And it's the best of Microsoft and OSS technologies to create a trustworthy experience. So when you look at the OSS, it starts with the Azure Sphere chip. That's a certified, certified chip. Then we have the Pluton runtime. Pluton runtime interacts with the Pluton uh, die or Pluton fabric that uh, uh, initiates all the uh, hardware to trust operations. We have a security monitor that runs in secure world that uh, basically provides and guards access to hardware resources on behalf of the operating system. We have our Linux kernel that runs in normal world that uh, provides all the services that you'd expect from the Linux kernel as well as a bunch of changes that we made to improve security. On-chip cloud services, the services that are basically daemons from Microsoft that focus on update and error reporting that run on the chip. And then we have secure application isolation. These are effectively sandboxes. They allow to run POSIX apps on top of the Cortex-A, and you can run bare metal uh, RTOSs on the Cortex-M. The Cortex-M relies on uh, basically features in chip to securely isolate that core from the other cores in the chip so they can uh, execute in isolation, provide those real-time guarantees you typically expect from a Cortex M in that space. And finally, Azure Sphere Security Service. So it brokers trust and detects emerging threats and also upgrades in device security. So it protects the device with certificate based authentication. Every device in the Azure Sphere ecosystem attests to the Azure Sphere Security Service every day. So if it hasn't attested in the last day, it actually isn't able to connect to any, any services, whether they're Microsoft or otherwise. And Azure Sphere does work with not only Azure and Azure IoT, but other cloud or on-prem infrastructure. In fact, it's quite simple to grab your uh, certificate chain and then be able to tell whether or not a device has attested to Microsoft successfully before it connects to your own cloud services. It detects emerging threats through these error reports that we talked about. And then it also ships updates. So we ship updates, major updates, four times a year. We ship bug fixes every month on the Azure Sphere operating system. Customers, as part of this product, can ship application updates whenever they want through our infrastructure with fully automated on-device updates and hand-free up hand uh, updates and deployments of customers' applications. So the security service is this last and third pillar that sews the Azure Sphere product together. So the other thing that's interesting from our perspective is that this is uh, Basically, we're, we're really sensitive to the cost of security when you think about a bomb cost for a device. So there's no subscription for Azure Sphere. So there's a license fee that comes as part of the chip. As part of that license fee, you get the operating system and you get updates as well as the attestation service and error reports for, I believe, uh, 13 years. So we don't want a company to think month to month, am I going to secure this device or not? Do I have to turn security off because this device is eight years old or nine years old? And so we decided to eliminate that by having a single cost as a software license with the chip. If you have other services that you want to that you want to uh, have in terms of machine learning or telemetry or analytics through Azure, then there is a subscription involved. But for the base service for updates and security, that's simply included. So security is foundational. I have to take away at the start. Uh, evaluate the seven properties when evaluating security plans. Is the device secure? Does it meet the seven properties? How is it going to stand up when a device is attacked or is exploited? Check out the white paper on the seven properties and, and try out Azure Sphere and give us feedback. We'd love to hear from you. So 
let's secure the future together. Thank you very much. So there are two 